Hi Weaving friends, thanks so much for taking a few minutes out of your day which is probably pretty busy like mine is and to just join me here for a little chat. There's a few things that I want to talk to you about today. There is one main reason that I decided to make this video today. My mind usually goes at 100 miles an hour. I've got hundreds of thousands of ideas and sometimes I just go I'm going to do that idea right now otherwise it's probably not going to happen. So this is one of those. So before I start chatting uh, about today's topic, I wanted to show you the new plaid double width project because a lot of you would have seen this online on social media. If you're on my mailing list, you would have received emails about the release of this pattern, which is more like an e-booklet than just a pattern. But I know it's always nice to see things in the cloth, so to speak. So I've got my blanket here and I just wanted to share with you what it actually looks like. So this is a double width project woven on my 24 inch rigid heddle loom with two heddles and two pickup sticks. Um, I wove mine from wool, but obviously you can use a, a variety of fibers and I'll just hold it up for you. Ta-da! So it's a really lovely project. I think it looks a little pale on camera actually, but you can never really get true colors on camera. It's very difficult. But if you go to the link that I give you down below, you can check out all about the e-booklet and you can see some more probably true to life color pictures of the blanket. It's, I used a fingering weight wool for this one and it's nice sometimes to have something a little bit lighter. I would often use a heavier weight wool for a double width blanket. Um, I'd probably use a light worsted or a DK and I've even used an iron weight or Australian 10 ply for a blanket before and that gives a much heavier blanket which is great for a you know depth of winter kind of blanket but we have just had the first day of spring here a couple of days ago it's the first time I've worn a t-shirt in what feels like forever I actually went for a walk before and I was sweating so it is starting to warm up here. Um, I guess you could say it's a, a transitional season. And if you are in the US or another part of the world, you're probably in a transitional season as well, but going in the opposite direction. So getting cooler. Anyway, it's a lighter weight blanket. And I think that's quite nice. Um, a couple of times I've been sitting out here working in the studio and I'll just have this on my lap and it's really nice because it's lightweight and it's warm, really warm, but not hot, not hot. So that's the blanket for those of you who wanted to see it. And there are a variety of options included in the booklet as to how to finish. I don't show you all the options for how to finish, but I give you suggestions. So for my finish, I hemmed on my sewing machine See the hem there it's probably hard to see um, and that's another great thing about having such a highly patterned blanket is when you come to things like hemming if you're not so confident as a sewer or you know it's a bit challenging for you to make a straight hem it doesn't really matter with something like this because you can't see it and the the pattern it draws your eye all over the blanket so any inconsistencies, any little floats and things like that tend to not really stand out like they normally might in say a plain weave, just a plain color all over. And that's another reason that something like plaid is an awesome option for doing double width weaving, especially if you're newer to it, because you would know the challenge, one of the challenges in weaving is to get a really nice fold. So with a busy pattern like this one, the fold is down the middle here I'm trying to hold it for you <laughs> not very successfully but yeah the folds there I can see the fold um, it's visible to me but I think a lot of other people wouldn't really notice it unless it was pointed out and that's that's pretty ideal for a double width project you don't want the eye to be drawn to the fold Anyway, as I said, I'm going to leave the link to that down below. The e-booklet is quite lengthy, so it includes all different information about double width weaving in general. 
then it has the project with step-by-step -step color photos and then it has a couple of pages of charts and written directions so I try to encompass every learning style I know some people learn better from visual charts some people need things written out to follow step by step and I try to do that so that everyone can accomplish something like this okay so on to the topic the reason that I am actually making this video today I was thinking about something before often I'll see a comment from a student online or somebody else online in a weaving group whatever it is and then I'll ponder on that for some time you know a funny thing about being having an online business is is seeing people talk about you online um, a lot of weaving groups I often see my name mentioned and people talk about me as though I'm this distant person um, I don't know whether they realize that I'm in most of the weaving groups on Facebook or not. I may not spend a lot of time there, but especially if someone tags me, I will be reading that post. But I'm not really sure if I'll ever get used to the idea of people discussing me as though I'm a celebrity. That's just way out for me. I'm like, hey, I'm just a housewife. How on earth does that happen? It takes a lot of getting used to I can tell you I'm not used to it yet anyway so I see a lot of things that people say about me most of the things that people say are really really nice really complimentary beautiful things from beautiful people and some of them are not so nice but I try to take it all on board and um, if I have negative feelings about some of the things that are said then I try to just let that go because I'm learning day by day that you'll just go crazy if you don't anyway um, I got way off on a tangent there what I wanted to talk about was people talking about right and wrong in weaving so one thing that bothers me online when I see it is when people are having a discussion that's maybe becoming a little bit argumentative and someone will say something like well Kelly says to do it this way and I read that and I'm like no I didn't I didn't say you have to do this this way what I do is I share and I show the things that work for me and all my classes are based on that just showing what I've learned through reading books but mostly through doing just doing over and over and over making the mistakes seeing what works seeing what works better seeing what doesn't work but there can be this kind of misconception that if you're teaching or showing people how to do something that that is then the only way to do that thing and that's completely false so something I often say to my students is I do it this way but if you find a way that suits you better, absolutely go with that. Contrary to popular opinion, I'm not a weaving expert. I'm passionate about weaving. I love doing it. I love learning more about it. And I absolutely consider myself a student of weaving. I'm not a master weaver. I don't know all the things. I'm on a journey just like you are. But coming back to right and wrong if there's one thing that I've learned in weaving it's that there is no one way to do everything there are always at least two maybe even more ways to do something and the best way to see what suits you is to just experiment you might want to access a range of classes so that you have a range of people presenting material to you. Try to enrich your weaving library if you can afford to do that by buying really good weaving books. Or if you can't afford to do that, check out your local library, see what they've got, see what you can get in, see if you can borrow books from people. Collaborate with others, join in discussions online. There's just so much to learn in weaving that we don't need to have weaving Nazis saying this is the right way and nobody should do it any other way because that's 
I think that's kind of against the community spirit of weaving. And I don't want anyone to think that that's what I'm doing in making classes and making YouTube videos for people. I'm not saying I know the best, I am the expert and you must do it my way. That's absolutely the opposite of how I feel about it. And that's why I think it's so important to share and expand your knowledge from a real variety of sources. And also spend lots of time experimenting, actually practicing at the loom. I think that's all I want to say on that subject. It's a tricky one because, as I said, I'm really not comfortable with, with people talking about me online as though they know exactly what I would say or what I would do in any given situation. But let's move on. Another thing I wanted to chat to you about, and the reason that I'm sitting at my floor loom to do this video is, um, I've had a really crazy busy couple of months. The weaving school is just going up and up, which is fantastic, um, but it's a heck of a lot of work. If anyone ever tells you that having an online business is easy, they are completely wrong. <laughs> it's a lot of work and it's very constant work. So recently I released my Inkle weaving class. Then I did this plaid blanket e-booklet. We've just started the September round of boot camp, and we have lots, lots of people enrolled. It's a really big one, which is fantastic and really exciting. But in between doing boot camp this month, I'm not planning to do a whole lot in terms of brand new material because I just need to give myself that break sometimes. And also I don't get a lot of time to actually weave projects that I would say are my passion projects that I just want to do for the sake of doing it for me. So I've been talking about this since last summer. This was supposed to be my summer project and we're just coming into spring now. So getting close to a year that I was supposed to have started this project and still haven't just because I simply haven't had time. And also I've had a, a bit of a stumbling block with it, actually a huge stumbling block. So I've talked before about my love of American historical coverlets, especially overshot coverlets. I also love summer and winter coverlets. But what I really want to do is an overshot coverlet. I have woven overshot fairly extensively now. It's not the overshot itself that bothers me. I find that very easy and really, I'm really comfortable with it now. It's the panels that trouble me and more specifically the seaming of the panels. Not even the seaming of the panels. It's more, it's to do with seaming. It's not the physical seaming that I have trouble with. It is matching the panels so that the seams are not as visible. I have a lot of trouble with this for some reason. Um, I think it's because I've woven overshot panels but I haven't joined them yet. And so for me, for the type of learner that I am, I really need to physically do something to really understand it. I'm not the sort of person who can just study something in theory and go, yep, got it, and then go to the loom and do that. I have to study a lot. I have to take a lot of notes. Um, and like I was saying, study from a variety of sources, but mostly books. And, and then come to the loom and decide how I am going to implement that plan. So that's what I'm working on right now. I'm just in the process of putting on this warp, putting on some 8-2 cotton. And the idea is um, I'm going to weave two overshot panels and then I'm going to seam them together and see how well I can match the pattern. So that's been sort of holding me back because if you're talking about doing a coverlet, that's a major work. It's, it's like a, a big bedspread. And so the seaming is not something that you want to get wrong on that. So I'm going to, I'm going to do this test warp. Um, I'm going to use some wool for the pattern weft and some more 8-2 cotton, same as the warp, for the background weft for the tabby. And I've done that quite a bit in 
overshot and I like the effect very much of the wool and the cotton. And then I'm just going to have a go at seaming them and I'm hoping that this project will just be enough to teach me what I need to do to match my pattern effectively. I mean, you wouldn't believe what a stumbling block this has been for me. It's been an ongoing issue and I'm just like, I cannot rest in my mind until I've completed a project that I've had as an idea successfully. It plagues me if I feel like I can't do it. And so uh, I might just find that, you know, the seam doesn't work out very well again. In that case, if that happens, then um, at least I will have tried out a new overshot pattern, which I am doing. It's, a, it's one that I haven't woven before and it looks really nice. And also I haven't used my floor loom since we moved here in May. And I was just feeling a bit sad about that and I really wanted to warp it up with something. So that's what I'm doing. This loom is um, a 90 centimeter weaving width. So it's, I think that's around 34, 35 inches. And so as far as something like a coverlet goes, I really have no choice but to do panels to sew together. And if I was doing, my ultimate goal is to do a coverlet for mine and my husband's bed, which is a queen size double. And for that, I would need to do three panels. One would be a center panel, and then I'd have to do side panels separately and then match those all up. So it's really quite a thing. Um, I've been in touch with Cassie Dixon who weaves the most gorgeous coverlets you've ever seen. Um, I'll leave her Instagram link down below so that you can have a look. She's got a really interesting page because she grows and processes uh, flax and all kinds of interesting things. Um, and even after speaking with her, I, I'm still really unsure. She referred me to a great book which I purchased. And that has been a big help. That's a Helen Jarvis book. Oh, I don't have it on hand. I can't remember what it's called. Something like weaving coverlets. It's hard to get these days. But I was lucky enough to find a copy. And yeah, it's a great book. And still I have this mental block matching the pattern at the seam. So wish me luck with that. If you like, um, I can do updates on this project and do a bit of a follow along if that's something that you find interesting and if I get time. <laughs> but for now, I just really want to enjoy weaving on my floor loom again, doing something that I want to do. I've probably waffled on for long enough now and I should probably get to threading. I'm at the threading point for this and that's going to take a while. One threading repeat is 204 ends, which is it's quite a lengthy threading repeat. So that's going to be interesting. I have to try not to make any mistakes with that. I hope you're having a great day and I hope that turns into a great week. And I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it's interesting enough for you. If you want to see more of these kind of, I don't know, what would you call it, a vloggy, chatty style video, let me know in the comments down below. Or if there's anything that I've talked about in today's video that you want to know more about, let me know about that as well. That helps me to know what you guys actually want to see on this channel. Oh, and by the way, I haven't forgotten about the free project that I mentioned a few videos back, quite a few videos back now. Um, I still have that churning around in my mind and I'm going to make that happen at some point. I just don't have a finished date for you yet. I just do what I can when I can. Anyway, folks, uh, until next time, happy weaving.